criminal law series. Tonight, the defense and prosecution of fraud. Our moderator for the evening is Niels Ortfed, who received his BA from U of T in 68 and LLB in 71, called to the bar in 1973. In addition to civil and criminal practice, he served as counsel to the Metropolitan Toronto Review of Citizen Police Complaint Procedures in 1975 and assisted Arthur Maloney in the preparation of his blueprint for the Office of the Ombudsman in Ontario. Niels has been very active in the Federation of Law Society programs and also lectures at the Bar Admission course. Over on the extreme, my extreme left, His Honour Judge Colleen. His Honour Judge Colleen is part of a group of four judges who came out of the same law firm in Ottawa. Mr. Justice Galligan was our guest two weeks ago. Judge Colleen was also a partner in the same law firm, and Judge Houston and Judge McWilliams also partners in that law firm at various points. I also note that Judge Colleen went to the same high school as Mr. Justice Galligan. He's presently the senior judge of the county court of the county of Middlesex and also president of the County Court Judges Association of Ontario. He's also been very active in numerous Federation of Law Society programs and Canadian Bar Association programs. Next to him is Ralph Fisher, our forensic accountant for this evening, member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants and a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Ontario, member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of British Columbia, and a senior partner with the firm of Laventhal and Horwath. He's national partner of that firm for management advisory services. He involves himself in valuation studies, securities and exchange commission registrations, sales acquisitions and mergers, and is involved in a great deal of courtroom accounting. He's also presently working on a manual called the litigation accountant. To the right of Niels is Corporal Giuliano Zaccardelli, known to everyone in fraud as Zac. He's a member of the RCMP for the past 10 years, assigned to commercial crime section for the past eight years, two years in Alberta and six in Toronto. For those of you that have been involved in any commercial crime cases, you've probably met Zac before. And just to name a few, for all you hockey fans, he investigated Clarence Campbell, Senator Louis Jaguer, and also Sid Rosen in a number of the frauds that Mr. Rosen was ultimately convicted of. Finally, Doug Hunt, graduated from Queen's University Law School in 1973 and called to the bar in 1975, has been with the Ministry of the Attorney General since his call to the bar, very active in Federation of Law Society programs, also an instructor at the bar admission course, and author of various articles, including one on conspiracy in the criminal law quarterly. Your panel for this evening. Thank you, Brian. Just by way of a very brief introduction, uh, conceptually, the offense of fraud is deceptively simple. Uh, shortly stated, the crime may be defined as deliberate, dishonest deprivation. Unlike many offenses in our criminal code, the evil sought to be countered by that definition appears readily understandable and indeed I think most laymen would, be, would think they could tell you exactly what fraud was all about. However, in its application, to a given set of facts, this is rarely the case. The presentation of a charge of fraud, the proof of such a charge is often complicated and problematical. The source of the majority of these problems, I think it can be fairly said, can be traced to the fact that fraud charges almost invariably are founded upon a documentary base. The rules regarding the admission of documents and the difficulty which can be encountered in collating documents in an organized and comprehensible manner 
often pose formidable hurdles. It's respect, with respect to those problems in particular that we intend to address our remarks to you today, and that is the manner of presentation and the proof of a fraud based in large part upon documentary evidence. I might just go on to say that these issues are of importance to us because fraud charges would appear to be one of the real growth industries of the 80s. In the past decade or so, the attention devoted to allegations of fraud uh, have, by law enforcement agencies, have really, uh, the, the attention has really multiplied uh, many times. Uh, the ever-growing numbers of investigators assigned to fraud cases and monies committed by law enforcement agencies and, and uh, various ministries of, the, of attorneys general to the prosecution of fraud cases is expanding such that uh, I think it's safe to say that, that there are many, many more cases coming before the courts today than would even have been attempted even 10 years ago. Consequently, the frequency with which all of us, that includes defense counsel, crown counsel, judges, accountants, not to mention police officers, are going to encounter the sort of problems that we're going to discuss, I think will inevitably dramatically increase in the coming years. Lastly, just before commencing, I want to point out that we have not passed out to uh, anything uh, detailing cases and citations. There won't be a great number of cases referred to. Those that are referred to with their citations will be included in the transcript of the materials which you will get at a later date. Just by way of comment on my introduction in relation to fraud generally, uh, Your Honor, uh, do you have any comments on my <coughs> remarks? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, is this mic working? Yes, I guess. The uh, law of fraud, I thought, was a simple matter when I was in practice uh, up until seven years ago because um, <coughs> during a uh, jury trial, and usually fraud cases that I was involved in were with a jury, I used to uh, not worry very much about the law. I'd sit back and when the... Uh, judge would charge the jury on the law of fraud, I would turn off my uh, earpiece and uh, just go to sleep, and as long as he mentioned reasonable doubt five times, I was satisfied with his charge. But um, I soon found after I got on the bench that, that uh, it was a difficult matter to charge a jury on fraud. Um, I think in terms of the Section 338.1 of the Code, which is the basic and seminal section that you're dealing with in fraud cases. There are related sections, but that's where the basic fraud charge arises. And um, we used to have to charge juries until the Olin case came along and explain to them, attempt to explain to them the elements of fraud as set out in that section. And uh, we used to go back to the old London and Globe case decided in 1903, and you'll remember in that case that Lord Buckley uh, explained the elements of fraud this way, to deceive, and he was <clears throat> attempting to explain what the word deceive meant, or deceit. And he said this, to deceive is, I apprehend, to induce a man to believe that a thing is true, which is false, and which the person practicing the deceit knows or believes to be false. He then went on to say, to defraud is to deprive by deceit. It is by deceit to induce a man to act to his injury, and so on. Well, when you'd give that to a jury, their eyes would quickly glaze over, and it was always obvious to me that they didn't understand what you were saying, and that when they went in the jury room, they would decide the case on a visceral reaction to the evidence. And that visceral reaction is now reflected in the Olin case, which was decided in 1978. And um, in that case, Mr. Justice Dixon attempted to codify and clarify the law as he 
uh, has done in other areas. You'll recall the famous judgment he delivered in Sault Ste. Marie and uh, in the trilogy of damage, case, uh, damage cases. Now what he's tried to do there is bring it down to a simplified nutshell and the nutshell, I suppose, is to ask yourself or to charge a jury in this way, was it dishonest? And really, that's what it comes down to now under the Olin case. Was the scheme, was the conduct deliberately dishonest? Something like that will suffice. Uh, but again, that requires visceral reactions to evidence. I would like to think that um, we're at a point then with Olin that uh, we have simplified the ingredients, and that from this point on with Olin, assuming that the uh, codifiers in Ottawa, that the legislature, uh, the federal parliament does not amend the whole sequence of sections of the code, that we have a pretty basic definition to work with. And if you start with the Olin case, I, it seems to me when you're doing research on a uh, potential fraud case that you might be involved in, you have it all there. Uh, subject to the facts. And I thought you might be interested uh, in the way of background to the Olin case uh, to look at some basic research materials that maybe you should all have. And uh, if I can give those to you, it seems to me that everybody who is dealing with a fraud case should have read the federal law reform working paper, number 19. That deals with theft and related offenses and contains a broad-ranging series of recommendations as to the future course of our fraud and theft sections of the criminal code. In <clears throat> that working paper, the Law Reform Commission recommends that we recast the 50-odd sections of the code dealing with theft and fraud and related offenses and put them into a new statute incorporated in the code, much like the Theft Act of 1968 in England. And if you will see in that report, they not only define the principles that have come out of the cases, including Olin and some of the English cases in the House of Lords and Court of Appeal in England, but they also give you an appendix of virtually every reported decision in the Canadian and English reports. There's a 30-page appendix uh, to that study, pages 75 to 123, in fact, and in that you have all the reported cases and a summary of the fact situations, so that uh, I can't think of a more useful law reform paper as a backgrounder to a fraud trial in its preparation by defense counsel or crown counsel, for that matter, than that paper. Another paper that I use and find um, eminently readable, understandable, and up-to-date is Doug Ewart's paper uh, entitled Fraud and Analysis of the Present State of the Law in Canada, which is reprinted in the Criminal Law Quarterly, 1980, pages 484 to 512, a superb summary of the state of the law, including the impact of Olin. No one who does work in this area of the criminal law should uh, be without that uh, paper, and uh, if I can recommend it to you uh, at the highest level, I do so. Another paper that you might be interested in, it's um, more in the, in the way of an orientation for Crown Counsel, but nevertheless it's useful to Defense Counsel, is by Rod McLeod. Rod, I, I gather, was giving a um, speech at a Western Canada Crown Seminar last April, and um, he was preaching the gospel, I suppose, uh, uh, as he is wont to do, and the title of the paper is Some Current and Practical Issues in Fraud and Conspiracy Prosecutions. It's a 72-page paper. Uh, he discusses the dredging case strictly from a pragmatic point of view in terms of proof requirements and so on, a superb paper if you can get your hands on it. Another one, and it's the last one, is by David Doherty uh, entitled What Constitutes Other Fraudulent Means uh, in the section 338 sub 1 uh, definition of fraud. That is an annotation at 39 Criminal Reports New Series pages 27 to 42, a superb compilation of the principles from the cases up to the time David wrote that paper. So uh, you should have those, I think, uh, in your uh, black book of materials when you're dealing with fraud. Thank you, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Doug, uh, just in terms of uh, fraud as a growing 
problem that's being uh, attacked by law enforcement agencies and crown agencies. Uh, do you have any comments briefly? Well, I think there's no question that it uh, has increased, the investigation of fraud and the prosecution of it have increased dramatically in the past uh, 15 years. I suppose there was a time in the early 1970s when in our, in our office there were probably only half a dozen prosecutions and uh, now in the last few years that may have increased by five or six times that many and I'm sure the uh, number that are being investigated by the uh, various fraud squads in the city have increased as well. Let me ask you, Zach, uh, how, for the benefit of those here, do you usually get involved in a fraud investigation? How do we get involved? Yep. Well, basically our doors are open uh, 24 hours a day and anybody can, <laughs> can walk in and register his complaint. And in a lot of cases, that's what, uh, exactly what happens. Uh, one of the peculiar things about fraud is that in the first instance, when somebody walks in off the street and uh, he says, uh, I answered an ad in the paper or uh, I got involved in a certain deal and uh, I lost my money, I, I got a phone number, I can't, uh, the line is not, no longer in service or uh, I write to a particular uh, post office box and I don't get any reply. He really doesn't know what's happened to him. He doesn't know whether he's been the, the victim of a fraud. And when, once he explains it to you, you really don't know whether he's been the victim of a fraud unless you conduct a follow-up investigation. And this is one of the things with uh, fraud investigations that in a lot of times you spend a, a great part of your day uh, following up on, on uh, complaints that are really unfounded. and. Uh, a great percentage of our time, you know, deals with investigating complaints that subsequently are found to be unfounded because the person doesn't know whether he's been the subject of a fraud and the circumstances, unless you follow up and find out certain things like, you know, that the XYZ company didn't exist and, uh, you know, certain individuals, you know, were perpetrating a fraud, you don't know that. So that's one of the major problems you have with investigating a fraud. When the, uh, mostly the individuals will come in, they have, uh, you know, they're interested in, of course, in recovering the monies that they, they feel they've lost. But a lot of times they, you know, they come in and they, they're willing to write off the loss, but they're concerned that, you know, this, this fraud or this, this scheme is not perpetrated further and other people aren't, aren't victim of that. Uh, you have the, the other kind of uh, complaint that comes in and, uh, He's adamant that he's been defrauded or an offense has taken place and he wants to know when these guys are going to be in jail and when he's going to be required to, uh, to attend in court. It's, it becomes a little difficult at times to tell him that, well, you know, it's, it's going to take a while before we can determine whether or not you have been uh, the victim of a fraud or whether you made a bad business deal. And that's the problem a lot of times. You can't tell. At the, at the first instance, whether that is a bad business deal that the guy went into, or he was, in fact, uh, a victim of, of a fraud. Now, most people, when they come in, they'll bring documents with them, and they'll, they'll supply you with whatever they have relating to the, uh, uh, to the allegation that they're made. And from there, you attempt to substantiate whether or not he has a valid complaint and a lot of times that is simply done on a gut feeling you know uh, I mean if the guy comes in and he says I, I bought a coat from uh, Simpsons and it hasn't been delivered yet I've been defrauded well you know you I think you can write it off there but if he gives you certain other pieces of information that you can't say that you know there's nothing to it you, you have to take some time to make inquiries with various government agencies or visit the location where these people are supposedly operating and so on. Um, Can I just ask you, do you get sometimes queries from those other than individuals who say they've been defrauded? Yes, we, that's, uh, we get queries from uh, many kinds of people, many, many kinds of uh, departments. Uh, one, uh, one major source of, uh, of complaints that we receive are from, from lawyers and uh, the most recent case, which was uh, publicized in, 
in the papers in other form of media, the media is the, uh, this, the Cuban coffee caper. Well, that, that was investigated by our office, but the person who brought it to our office was a lawyer from Toronto, and he stated, I represent the Cuban government, and this is what we believe this has taken place. From that, an, an investigation was initiated to determine whether or not the, the complaint was founded, and it subsequently did prove to be a very founded complaint. So lawyers are, in fact, a, a major source of our complaints. A, a lot of times lawyers will come in and they say, listen, I haven't seen the inside of a criminal courtroom since uh, you know, I walked through one during law school. And they readily admit that they don't know what they have and they want, they want some assistance from you. They, uh, they either represent a, a corporation or a client and certain things have taken place within the corporation or his client has been involved in certain transactions and he, in certain cases, will feel that an offense has taken place and he will request an investigation or in some cases he will simply ask, you know, can you do something for my client? So lawyers are a major source of, of complaints for us. Another area where we, uh, we get a lot of complaints is uh, dealing with bankruptcies. Now, bankruptcies, the major source of uh, complaints with bankruptcies come from trustees, uh, accountants, mainly our trustees, but they will, bankruptcies take place either by assignment or by petition. Uh, what happens is a trustee will be appointed to look after a, uh, a bankruptcy and during his investigation, in a lot of cases, he will come across certain transactions which he feel, feels are very questionable. And he can request an investigation. He can go to the local official receiver, who will then go to Ottawa to the superintendent of bankruptcy, who will issue an investigative order. Uh, offenses under the Bankruptcy Act can only be investigated with the, uh, the order from the superintendent of bankruptcy. In that way, it comes back to the RCMP because uh, in bankruptcy offenses are only investigated by the, uh, by the RCMP. So in, the trustees are one major source of information. We simply have to wait for them in a lot of cases to refer uh, allegations of fraud to us. Let me just interrupt you there. Ralph, uh, you, I know, have had quite a bit of contact with bankruptcies. Has this uh, instance ever arisen in your practice? Not only it has arisen, it's mandatory. We are obliged in our receiver section to call to the attention of the master, who in turn transfers it to Zach, anything that we suspect may be fraud. We not only call it to their attention, but we document it, we make our working papers available, and we explain why we've made the call. Things like, uh, I can recall one I was involved in. Fur, retail fur store inventory disappeared out of the back door between the 1st of January and the 6th of January. No accounting, no recording, no proceeds, and a bankruptcy on the 6th of January. That one went all the way to trial. Uh, tile disappearing uh, out the back door, shipped via the shipper to a store that he set up on his own. It was, he was against, he was for free enterprise. He set up his own store, but he forgot to account. Uh, we've, we're obliged to, and we have called uh, Zach in. My only objection to all of that is we do not get a finder's fee. <laughs> Doug, uh, let me ask you this. Just moving on to the whole issue of search warrants. Uh, uh, do you ever get contact to uh, are you, are you ever contacted by police officers uh, who are looking for information regarding search warrants or assistance in relation to search warrants, and uh, what advice uh, are you inclined to give them? Well, it's quite common for uh, the police to come to see the Crown prior to applying for a search warrant, perhaps more often in the cases where they are going to go out and search a lawyer's office and they uh, appreciate that there is a potential problem of solicitor client privilege that may be raised when they arrive. It's a difficult position I think for the Crown to be in when 
the request is for assistance in connection with the search of a lawyer's office, um, much more difficult than when it's just a request for assistance in respect of a, a search of some other premises. The, it's the legal issue of solicitor-client privilege that creates the problem, not because there's any special status attached to a lawyer, but the Crown's role is delicate in the sense that you have to try and balance the right of the police to search that office pursuant to the terms of a warrant unrestricted by uh, any claim of solicitor-client privilege. There is no legislation at the present moment that uh, makes that an issue. You have to balance that right with the lawyer's obligation that you know he has to claim solicitor-client privilege uh, in respect to certain documents where it's appropriate. And essentially then the position with the police is to give them legal advice with respect to the information to obtain a warrant and with respect to the warrant itself to ensure that it will stand up to scrutiny on a, on a certiorari application. And secondly, to give them practical advice with respect to the execution of the search uh, in the hopes that ultimately you're going to reconcile the two interests, the interests of the police and the interest of the lawyer who's being searched. With respect to general advice concerning search warrants and information, basically cover with the police those items that the criminal code sets out as being necessary uh, information to be contained in an information. Uh, the grounds of the belief that the documents are in a particular uh, building, place, or receptacle. The description of the offense itself, the description as particularly as it can be uh, drawn of the items to be seized. Uh, the reasonable grounds for belief that the documents are actually going to afford evidence with respect to a particular offense. And uh, finally, a description of the offense which will be sufficient to meet the requirements of the code and stand up to uh, any certiorari application. And that will include the dates, times, places, if it's fraud, the, the means. Was it by deceit, falsehood, or other fraudulent means? What was the party defrauded of? Money, property, or valuable security, and the, the value. The general purpose here is to give the JP who's going to uh, accept the information a sound basis for issuing the warrant. Now more specifically with respect to the, to the lawyer's offices, there has to be a great deal of consideration giving to, given to the, the grounds for belief that the documents are there. Uh, in the information, they'll have to be uh, the basis for that belief set out. Is it a solicitor-client relationship or is there some other relationship? It may be that they're business partners. It may be that uh, it's uh, corporate documents that are being looked for and the lawyer is not only the solicitor for the corporation but he's also an officer of the corporation and if it's in that capacity that he holds the documents then there'll be no solicitor-client privilege. Secondly, the reasonable grounds for belief that the documents are going to afford evidence with respect to the offense of fraud. In this area, we have to deal with the question of whether the lawyer is a party to the offense or is he being used by the person suspected of having committed the offense to, to cover uh, his transactions by the, the cloak of privilege. And, if it is one of those two situations, then specific information is put right into the document presented to the Justice of the Peace, setting that out. The third area of real concern when you're searching a lawyer's office is the description of the documents that are to be uh, obtained by the police. It has to, they have to be put into categories which are so specific that uh, they'll meet really two tests. The first one that the officer searching has to be able to find those documents from the description in the warrant. It can't be a fishing expedition that he goes on and taking what he pleases. And then, more importantly, 
to set into categories those documents which on any reasonable view couldn't be the subject of a solicitor client privilege in any event. Uh, for example, the corporate minute books, uh, copies of agreements which have already been obtained from third parties, copies of correspondence between third parties that have uh, ended up in the lawyer's files. Uh, there are a number of documents which just on, on no view could be a solicitor covered by the solicitor client privilege. There's an attempt to describe those categories of documents expressly so that it reduces the misunderstanding or the, the, the possibility of a misunderstanding between, as between the police and the justice of the peace. Some special care is taken to ensure that the appropriate provisions get carried over into the search warrant itself, the description of the documents, um, the description of the offense, there may be the added consideration of naming an accountant in the warrant who may accompany the police on the search in order to assist them locating the documents. Okay, let me, let me just interrupt there. Assuming, Ralph, that you are the accountant who is named and who is accompanying the police officer who is executing the warrant, uh, do you want to see every last document on the company's premises? Do you, I think that would be a waste of time. I don't know why you would be looking at every last document at that point of time. You haven't got the faintest idea outside of the, what the warrant says of what you're looking at, what you're going to find, and how important it can be. But I'd like to reverse it, if I may. If you're talking about search and seizure, taking that material away, then if I was on the opposite side, I'd take violent exception to that. And the reason I take exception to that is I like to see the pieces of paper in their natural habitat in the business premise. Reason, the sequencing of filing, how they're filed, what pieces of paper are put where, are very important to an investigative accountant. If they take it away and all you get back at a point of time, the next day or two years later, are Xeroxes of the material, you've lost a tremendous opportunity to have some insight on the, in the case itself. And if you get back Xerox, remember, Xerox does not indicate color, does not indicate if there's been a change of ink, or if something has been added at a second period of time. So give me my choice, leave everything in a cocoon. If I haven't got my choice, I want to know exactly, as best one can tell me, where they were and how they were sequenced. Looking at the pieces of paper at that point of time, you can skim through them very quickly. You, if it's an obvious thing that you're looking at, sure. But if, you're, if it's voluminous, it's useless. Your Honor, assuming you're the one who's contacted and you now you have uh, gone back into practice and you're giving advice uh, uh, and you get a call from a client who says the police are at his door with a search warrant uh, and want to seize every document in the premises, what's your advice? And it's usually 12 midnight. Uh, well, uh, I never had any problem in this area because all my clients were innocent. <laughs> but uh, at least that's what they told me. The, uh, probably the first question I'd ask is, how in hell did you get my phone number? <laughs> but um, then maybe I'd say, well, call your accountant or call Ralph Fisher here. He knows all the answers. And finally, I'd start thinking about uh, the sections of the legislation that you might be dealing with. If you're dealing with the criminal code, um, obviously you have to uh, think on your feet quickly over the telephone in terms of, uh, of the, uh, se the relevant sections, 443 to 6, I think it is, where you have codified the present criminal code law on search warrants. And as uh, Doug has already said you have to think in terms of the specifics that have to go into the search warrant. So the client is calling you and uh, is asking you what to do. Uh, he has seen the piece of paper waved in his face, the search warrant presumably. You have to, um, I think as a pragmatic matter, uh, ask him to turn over the telephone to the, uh, uh, the investigators who are there and speak to them and see if they're rational and reasonable. 
And usually they are, um, I may add, um, if not invariably. Uh, you can uh, dialogue with these officers. They're just trying to do their job and um, establish some ground rules. You may want to go down, of course, uh, whatever the hour, and, um, and uh, meet the men face to face. Now, the first thing you have to find out is, uh, is uh, the specifics of the charge and the specifics of what they're looking for. Um, somebody said to me once that the criminal code is a blue collar statute. And uh, in terms of the search warrant sections, you'll see that really what they're usually looking for are the you know, instruments of housebreaking or uh, the stolen goods, things of that sort. We're now moving into this era of commercial crime when they're looking for more. And um, voluminous, voluminous documents are probably in the premises. Let's say it's a business uh, operation that they've uh, gone into. So uh, you've got to think in terms of uh, an agreement that they're not going to strip the premises. Because that has happened in my experience, and I'm sure in the experience of many others, that it sometimes is the case that they want to take everything out of there in a truck. Now that's not reasonable in most instances, and you can usually establish some ground rules as to what's going to be taken. If there are documents in the area of solicitor and client privilege, if it's a lawyer's office, of course, then you should follow procedures uh, of sealing those documents which the lawyer suggests might have attached to them solicitor and client privilege. And those can be sealed separately and dealt with uh, subsequently uh, so that the, there's been no patent violation of the solicitor client privilege. And also, you can get agreements as to whether your own side, that if you're the defense lawyer, you may want to look at the documents, you may want an accountant into the picture, and we may come to that later, and you may want your side to see the documents in their pristine glory before they've been taken out and put out of sequence and before Xeroxes start flying around, because Xeroxes, as Ralph has just said, are not uh, very useful to you very often because they have been put out of context, they're different colors, they don't look like the originals necessarily. So all of these factors are swirling around when you're meeting um, in, the, uh, in the business premises and when you're telling your client over the telephone what his rights are. The problems in this area, however, for a lawyer are virtually insurmountable. And th this is one of the things where I think uh, the bar and perhaps the judiciary too, and uh, I, I don't say that one is to blame more than the other, but in this country, I think we've sadly neglected the law of search warrants, and we have allowed it to be treated as, as a mechanical facet, a purely mechanical facet of the investigative process, whereas the Americans, our brethren to the south, have uh, taken this area of the law very seriously, flowing from their constitutional uh, rights, and have developed, uh, that is, the practicing bar and the courts have developed a far more serious approach in their jurisprudence to the rights and wrongs of search warrants and seizures incident to the issuance of search warrants. Um, if you can realize it, most of your search warrants are issued perfunctorily under section 443 of the code. Uh, you don't have to have a search warrant at all in certain situations, grave situations, under the uh, Customs Act, the S Excise Act, the Narcotics, Narcotic, Narcotic Control Act and the Food and Drug Act. We still have the uh, ancient writ of assistance in existence, which uh, enables officers who carry those writs to enter premises uh, without uh, the safeguards that uh, attach to a writ for the accused set out in the code. Now, I think that um, we're, we're not far from that point in our evolution where we uh, will require and call for a complete overhauling of the law dealing with search warrants under the code, uh, under the Income Tax Act again, and under these other statutes. If you look in the Income Tax Act, sections 231 and 232, and you may all have a lot of clients who uh, get hit with fraud charges under that statute, 
you have to be aware of Section 232, which codifies the uh, rights, duties, and obligations of all parties concerned where solicitor-client privilege is urged. You might take a look at three seminal cases which may or may not be helpful to you in that area, and that's the Borden and Elliott law firm case reported in 1975, 30 CCCs, second series, and the Bergeron and Deschamps case, a judgment of the Supreme Court of Canada reported in 1977, 33 CCCs, second series, and in a Western case, an Alberta case as I recall it, Re Alder, 1977, 37 CCC's second series. Now those cases get into the specifics of uh, the, the validity of a search warrant uh, from various angles. And I simply suggest to you that uh, this whole area of the law, especially under the code, is going to probably be recodified in the next two years. Uh, it's under study now and we may get, we may get uh, a recodification of the solicitor-client privileges and the duties and obligations on the investigative officers and solicitors flowing from that, somewhat analogous to Section 232 of the Income Tax Act. But if you look at the law under 232 of the Income Tax Act, as it has evolved over the past several years, it's in a highly unsatisfactory state. And really, it's very difficult to know where your, what your rights are. My view is that at the present time, assuming you've satisfied the specifics of uh, Section 443 or, say, 232 of the, of the Code or uh, uh, 232 of the Income Tax Act or 443 of the Code, that it is a carte blanche um, virtually uh, to the investigators to get everything out of there if they want to, especially when they're dealing with uh, a citizen who becomes obstreperous. And the, the problem is beyond that, that the citizen and his lawyer may end up being charged with obstruction under 118 or uh, assaulting a police officer in the execution of his duty under 246 of the code. So you've got all sorts of problems. It's a thicket right now. Okay, thank you. Doug, uh, I want to move on, but in two minutes or less, uh, assuming you're, the, you're a crown and you get a, a call from me and I have a police officer like Zach in my office and firstly uh, I want to have him seal certain documents he wants to seize and he is reluctant to do so uh, or in the event you were to get a call about uh, Ralph's problem uh, that the, the person being searched wants to have someone look at the documents in their uh, pristine state namely the way they're organized at the time of the search what sort of advice uh, are you going to give in particular, what's the state of the law in relation to solicitor client privilege? Well, two minutes, in two minutes or less, uh, just by way of quick background, in advising the police how to act on a search, the, ex the execution of a search warrant of a lawyer's office, our advice would be that uh, w when the claim of privilege is made, that uh, the lawyer be invited to examine the documents uh, and apply some objective assessment to whether or not they really fall under the uh, umbrella of solicitor-client privilege. I mentioned before there are certain documents that just can't fall under that privilege because of their nature. Uh, if the lawyer is prepared to sit down and look at the documents and bring some objective consideration to them and then set aside the ones that he, uh, after considering them seriously, wants to make the claim in respect of, then I think the, the police will accept them in a sealed package and take that to the justice of the peace along with the other documents seized. If it's a case where the phone call comes down to the Crown from uh, either the lawyer being searched or a lawyer retained by that lawyer and it, the request is to advise the police to do that, uh, I'm not sure that the, the Crown is, is acting responsibly if he simply gives that advice. Uh, this is a different situation. He hasn't had any contact with the police over that particular case. He doesn't know the facts. He doesn't know what's contained in the information. He doesn't know what's contained in the warrant. He doesn't even know the, the nature of the offense or the lawyer with whom they're dealing. I think probably uh, the Crown would attempt to 
talk to the officer if the officer wished to speak to him. I don't think it's the Crown's job to inject himself into the process at that stage and give advice if the police don't really want it. But assuming the officer wishes to speak to him, I think the Crown has to attempt to get as much information out of the officer as he can concerning the investigation, the search, what that officer's assessment of the lawyer is, is he acting responsibly, etc. And if on the basis of that information you conclude that it is an appropriate case to, to advise this uh, middle of the road procedure of accepting the documents, then I think it's, it's fair to do it. Uh, it's not something you would do in every case and it's certainly not something you would do until you've had a chance to, to speak to the, to the officer. If the claim is that they want someone to come down and examine the, the documents uh, in the files before they're taken out, I think, again, everybody has to try and act reasonably. If it's not going to uh, delay the matter such that anything has to be left for any uh, period without the police being there, I think it could probably be complied with. If it's going to mean the police going away and leaving the documents and coming back tomorrow, then under no circumstances would I uh, advise the police to do that. If it couldn't be worked out, I think the, the advice would be that they should simply take the documents uh, in the way they would in a normal search. The legal position with respect to uh, solicitor client privilege as it relates to search warrants, it certainly isn't settled. Um, there is a trend of judicial opinion going to the view that it is perhaps a rule of property as opposed to a rule of evidence and therefore can be raised at an earlier stage than when the evidence is being tendered. <clears throat> there are cases uh, going both ways on that, uh, including Mr. Justice Osler, who has gone both ways in two different cases, uh, but he acknowledged in the second case that he had rethought his position and come to the conclusion that he was wrong when he said it was a rule of evidence. So uh, in Ontario, it's never gone to the Court of Appeal uh, expressly on that issue. The court had the opportunity to comment on it in, uh, in Reborden and Elliott that his honor has mentioned, but declined to do so. The Supreme Court of Canada recently, in a case called uh, Soloski versus the Queen, which has just been reported in the National Reporter, dealt with an application for declaratory relief in the case of uh, a prisoner whose correspondence with his solicitor was being opened by the prison. They reviewed the issue of solicitor-client privilege, and Mr. Justice Dixon, speaking for eight of the members of the Supreme Court, acknowledged that the, the judicial movement towards holding it was a rule of property, but he rationalized the cases that held it to be so as merely shifting the time at which the claim can be raised from uh, the time when the evidence is being tendered to an earlier point in time, and he concluded that it had not yet reached the stage where solicitor-client privilege was a rule of property. So, uh, in summary, it, the legal position is, is still very much in dispute. Um, if you wish to raise it at an earlier stage than the trial, you'll certainly find authority for so doing. The legislation that was proposed in Bill C-51 to amend the criminal code and bring into it a procedure that requires the documents to be sealed up uh, died, but I understand it's to be reintroduced, and uh, if that is enacted, it would certainly remove the problem of how it's to be handled at the time of the search and then provide a mechanism for deciding the issue prior to the trial. Moving on to the stage now where it's a matter of evidence, uh, Judge Colleen, what sort of issue should the uh, that defense in particular be alive to in relation to the introduction of documents? Well, uh, the starting point uh, are the Ontario and Canada Evidence Acts, and uh, you, have, you start really with the Canada Evidence Act, as it seems to me, and any evidentiary provisions for notice and the like in the code, too, but um, seminal, and it seems to me a lot of people uh, don't bother looking at the Canada Evidence Act uh, in this uh, difficult area where you're dealing with documents, but sections uh, 29 and 30 in 
uh, are the are the keys really you're dealing with bank records and their admissibility under section 29 uh, that section was dealt with by the our court of appeal in the McMullen case um, not long ago and um, in that case uh, it's interesting to see how the court has encrusted on the uh, section some rather onerous obligations on the Crown uh, to establish the groundwork or lay the groundwork for admissibility of uh, computer printouts. And I know that some Crowns are of the view that that decision, if it stands uh, and is not ignored <laughs> in practice, would make it virtually impossible in certain situations for the Crown to go forward uh, without great cost in, in situations to the proof of, uh, of uh, computer printout records. Now, uh, Section 30, however, it seems to me is so broadly and vaguely worded that you can always get around Section 29 by using Section 30, which is the business records section, uh, which has a notice requirement in it. Uh, section 29, as I recall it, does not. The um, you, you should look, therefore, at those sections when you're clashing with the Crown about uh, documents and um, their admissibility. Uh, you might also, you, you can go through the um, other sections, but Section 37 is an interesting one and is also lost sight of. That section says that where the <clears throat> Canada Evidence Act is silent, the Ontario Evidence Act applies, or provincial laws dealing with evidentiary matters applies. Don't lose sight of that because there may be something hidden away in the Ontario Evidence Act which uh, may or may not um, obstruct or impede or expedite uh, the Crown's uh, proof of its case. Uh, you might take a look at some sections of the Narcotics Control Act and the Food and Drug Act because uh, you're all, I suppose, familiar with the uh, admissibility of the uh, analyst certificate and so on. Uh, T consider the wiretap provisions of the Criminal Code, the Protection of Privacy provisions, uh, Section 178.16, which um, requires notice uh, if the Crown is intending to introduce wiretap evidence, and it requires uh, the Crown before trial to give reasonable notice of the uh, transcript of the uh, wiretap, now, and also particulars of time and place and the like. Um, it seems to me that uh, some defense counsel uh, forget about the particulars uh, clause stuck in there under which uh, the defense can move before the court, not before the trial judge, bef but before the court in which the case will be tried uh, to get better particulars uh, of the uh, wiretap evidence that is to be tendered. And you may run into uh, uh, obstreperous Crown Counsel. I'm not saying they exist, but they may exist uh, in somebody's imagination who uh, are not willing to give you the kind of disclosure that they ought to in your perception of the matter. So don't lose sight of that particulars uh, entitlement that you have under Section 178.16 and the requirements that the Crown have to satisfy as a condition precedent to admissibility under the uh, uh, Protection of Privacy Act. Okay, there. Let me just, I want to ask Doug to comment on, on that, but you know, I just before doing so, I pause to note that uh, where you have a section such as Section 29, which deals specifically with bank documents, I might uh, argue with you that uh, that a crown was not permitted to uh, obviate the provisions of that section to use a more general section, uh, namely Section 30, because of principles of statutory interpretation, but Doug, uh, just from the point of view of the Crown, what are the possible evidentiary problems that uh, you are going to have to anticipate? Well, I think some of the problems uh, emanate from the way in which the police seize the documents or accept them from people, and some of them emanate from the legislation. The documents uh, basically come from four places, the accused, uh, financial institutions, businesses, or uh, a witness, a third-party witness who they're either seized from or turns them over. When the police seize from the accused, uh, there's no real problem if it's a small seizure and uh, one or two officers are involved because the officers take the time to 
initial each uh, document and there's a record on the back of it indicating when they seized it and they can later identify it as being seized from the accused. But when it's a large seizure involving maybe 25 or 30 officers, some of whom are on loan from the drug section and the general investigation section, and boxes and boxes go out, then you run into uh, a potential uh, problem with when it comes time to prove that they were actually seized from the accused. Uh, for example, one piece of paper from a file folder in the middle of a, of a box may be the document that's critical to the Crown. That was seized by an officer from the drug section who simply took the file folders out of a filing cabinet and put them in the box. Uh, unless real care is taken by the police at that stage in order to ensure that that man who seized them has some way of recalling that he seized that document, then it's difficult to see how he can testify at a later stage to the fact that he seized it from the accused. It can be solved by uh, a well-planned search where the officer who takes the, filing, the folders from the filing cabinet and puts them in a box, when he fills that box, he seals it with tape and initials it, and then turns it over to a central place where the investigating officer is keeping track of things. He initials the tape as well, and he assigns a number to that box. Now, he's the only one who opens it, that's the investigating officer. Uh, he keeps track of what papers he takes out of it, what he puts into it, if anything, and at a later stage, the officer who sees the, the, who turned over the box can be called to identify that box. All he remembers is he put file folders in, he sealed it, he turned it over to uh, Zach. Zach can be called and say, this box is as I got it from Officer Jones, and I took this paper from the, this file folder in the center. At that point, you have established a chain that takes that piece of paper back to the possession of the accused. But unless that's planned in advance, it can uh, quite often happen that uh, your officer who's uh, intending to prove the, the seizure has no recollection of it. Those that are seized from financial institutions and businesses, the policeman cannot give the evidence to admit those documents under Section 29 and Section 30. Uh, Section 29, for example, requires that it uh, be an entry in a book kept by the bank, uh, that it be made um, at a time when that record was, in fact, a record of the bank, uh, that it was made in the usual and ordinary course of business. So clearly, a policeman can't give that so sort of evidence, but it's strange. Some of them think that they can, that the mere fact they've taken it from the bank means it goes in as evidence. And so, too, with business records under Section 30, uh, the policeman can't testify it was one that was made in the usual and ordinary course of business. So the Crown has to call someone from either the bank or the business through whom that uh, document will be, will be entered. Now, again, if it's a small search, there no, should be no difficulty because the policeman can ask the people from whom they take it to initial those documents. and. Presumably at a later stage, they can recognize their initials, recognize it as either a banking document or a business record, and establish the basis for its admission. But if, it, if it's a large search, uh, there's a, a great danger that uh, by the time those documents are put in front of someone who would have been in a position to give that evidence, that person can't remember the document. Uh, it's been a long time since he's seen it. It may not by its nature uh, refresh his memory. So again, the police have to uh, clearly mark the documents when they get them so that there's no problem insofar as their ability to prove where it came from is concerned. And they also, in the case of business records and banking records, have to get back to the person who will ultimately provide the basis for its admissibility and get him to endorse somewhere on it that it is a in fact, a bank record or business record. So two years later at the trial, he'll see his own handwriting on it, and it will come back to him. 